So we begin this evening. Uh, our topic this evening is Roman religion and Jewish temple religion uh, in Jerusalem in the first, up to the first century. When I first started studying uh, Roman culture and we took classes over to Rome to study, uh, my impression was, uh, after seeing, for example, the Colosseum and all the blood sport that went on, was that really what the Romans were were pagans. They were pagans and they were very materialistic. <clears throat> now I gotta tell you that over the past couple of years of continuing this study, I have a different idea and attitude about that. Uh, and that idea and attitude, we have to think about that for a minute. <laughs> this happens at home all the time, oh, there it is. <laughs> it's usually my wife that finds it. <laughs> um, that attitude has changed from the Romans being pagans and materialists into something quite different. Uh, because, uh, as you'll see in a moment, the Romans really saw the world as filled with gods. In that respect, they were very reverent, even though in their culture they had some different kinds of ideas that are uh, different than the Western world now holds. When you think about going to Rome, how many have been to Rome? Nice number have been to Rome. When you think about going to Rome, and you think about walking on the old Appian Way, and you see how it goes ultimately to the Via Sacra, the sacred way, onto uh, the Forum, what do you see when you look in the Forum? Don't say roads. <laughs> you see, somebody raise a hand. You see all kinds of temples all kinds of temples, to all kinds of gods. And they're not small temples, they're large temples. And when you go on to the Capitoline Hill, for example, uh, you again see all kinds of temples, and uh, temples to, to uh, Jupiter. Uh, one of the great temples was uh, uh, the temple to Jupiter, the best and the brightest, the best and the greatest, uh, which is Optimus uh, uh, Maximus, that best and greatest god. When you go, uh, you see the Pantheon, which is a beautiful building, an amazing piece of architecture, but dedicated to all the gods. So for the uh, Romans, they worshiped many, many gods. But these notes, by the way, you'll notice a little name at the top, are by a woman by the name of Warrior, who wrote uh, an excellent uh, two books, actually, on Roman religion, and a lot of this material comes from that book. It's not really big, so if you're interested in following through some of these topics, I, I can show you the book and would recommend it to you. So we see here uh, that there are six features of Roman religion. And the first one is the gods exist, but you cannot count on their benevolence. The gods are everywhere. There are all kinds of, of gods that the Romans had. And for this, I'm going to have to... That's pretty hard to read, isn't it? <laughs> Rabbi Adlin, that's what I meant. The Romans worshipped different kinds of gods. Some were anthropomorphized, the state gods, and they were gods like Ju uh, Jupiter and Juno and Mars. Some of the lesser deities were uh, deities such as Castor and Hercules and Flora. Flora, goddess of flowers. Some of the gods were household gods. Every home had its own lares. A lar was a household god that looked over the entire house. And as one would get to know the various gods of the house, you would find out that there were, it looks like genius, genius gods, that were sort of stand-ins for individuals in the house. Every household member had its own deity, if you will. And those uh, household gods and, that took care of the individual people uh, were very often represented either as statues or busts and also often as masks. And we'll see when we talk about funerary customs that a lot of these masks were previous generations that one would keep in the house so that you could keep in touch with your ancestors as a uh, Then there was Vesta, who was the goddess of the hearth. You know about the Vestal Virgins. We'll talk about that a little bit later, I think. Uh, 
And then there were also the finates. Those were the gods that took care of the larder, took care of where you stored the food. So there were all those kinds of gods. There were even gods of diseases that affected livestock and crops, because gods very often have to do with fertility. There were some abstracts that were uh, worshipped as gods, if you will. The god of hope, concord, and mind. Then there were the non-anthropomorphized gods that one would see in the environment. Uh, and these were such places as the spirits of streams and mountains and woods. We'll read a little more about that in a few moments. And finally, there were deified mortals. We're told that uh, once Romulus established the city of Rome, as it came time for him to die, he became a god. He became Quirinus. And one of the uh, areas in Rome is the Quirinal Hill. Uh, so mortals could become gods. Emperors, Julius Caesar was declared to be a god. Sometimes their wives came in on the coattails of their husbands. Um, is that beautiful? <laughs> That is Lake Nemi, uh, and you'll hear, I'll find it right now to tell you about it. So um, this is a, a little piece about, uh, by Seneca the Younger, who wrote about these natural sites. He said, if you come upon a grove that is thick with ancient trees rising far above their usual height and blocking the view of the sky with their cover of intertwining branches, the loftiness of the forest, the seclusion of the spirit, and your wonder at the unbroken shade in the midst of open space will create in you a sense of the divine, of the numen. That's numen as in numina not Newman as in Paul. Um, <laughs> or if a cave made by a deep erosion of rocks support a mountain with its arch, a place not made by hand but hollowed out by natural causes into spaciousness, then your mind will be aroused by a feeling of religious awe. Religio. We venerate the uh, sources of mighty rivers, we build an altar, where suddenly a great stream bursts forth from a hidden course. We worship hot springs and we deem lakes sacred because of their darkness and immeasurable depth. Um, how did that happen? <laughs> 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 Forgive me. I don't want to leave you hanging with this. There are many such volcanic lakes in Rome, outside of Rome, in Italy, and they are the kinds of things that when you come up to the top of the mountain and you look down, it's like looking into the Grand Canyon. You feel that sense of spirituality. Uh, the Romans felt that way about deep forests, about the little copse of trees that stood out in the midst of nothing, but all of a sudden a beautiful uh, group of trees. These evoke this sense of divine presence. Uh, so we have that. And then, as I mentioned before, I'm just going to do this one. <coughs> there were people who were uh, deified. I don't remember whether this is Constantine or whether it's Augustus Caesar, but you can see the size, uh, a little bit bigger than me. Uh, and people could become gods as well. Let me see what I can do this properly. Let's we know also that Roman gods often had Greek names. Uh, one of the things that I thought my first trip to Rome was that the Romans were pretty arrogant. I thought so because, number one, they had uh, Roman uh, types for Greek gods, also because of their art. When you uh, look around at some of the uh, 
uh, predecessors of the Roman Empire, and Etruscan art, and so on, you would see that the Romans copied it. And I'm, as you went through, it's almost as though it was their own. Uh, as you begin to think about what the Romans were saying as they looked at these different kinds of gods, uh, the Roman version of the Olympian gods, Jupiter for Zeus, Juno for Hera, uh, Venus, the goddess of sexual arousal, uh, Diana, who was the, the goddess of the hunt and also of waste spaces and distant spaces, uh, Ceres, uh, uh, who was the goddess of wheat and growth and fertility, um, Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, Mercury, as interest was the goddess, uh, the god of movement. So, because, you know, we think of Mercury as running around all this time. So Mercury was the god of, of, for example, commerce, because ships would go out and would come back. And this movement was governed, they felt, by Mercury. Um, the, 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 the Vulcan, the god of fire, Neptune, uh, the god of the seas, and Mars, the god of war. Um, I thought, my goodness, they just, you know, borrowed that. There is a, another book on, on the Roman Empire uh, by a man by the name of Wolf, uh, W-O-O-L-F, in which he makes an interesting statement. So many of the uh, empires and, and countries round about had such a veneration for Greek culture, Greek art, and Greek learning that what the Romans were really trying to do was not to be able to take over that and to adopt it themselves, but rather they were trying to create what they called humanitas, a universalization. These gods were universal for all people. Uh, gods did a whole variety of things. Uh, one of the things we'll see in a little while is that much depended on the gods. The second feature uh, is the feature of duot days which basically means, I give, so you'll give. It was the idea that in order for us to be successful in life, the gods had to favor what we did. And therefore, the Romans developed a pretty sophisticated system of sacrifice with the idea that I give you this gift so that you, God, will then smile upon me. Uh, we're going to see some of those gifts uh, pretty soon. Uh, it was the fact that we needed the gods to be plied with prayers and with gifts and sacrifices. And they had to be done properly so that our cultus, our cult, our worship, would be acceptable and find the favor of the gods. That word cultus comes from the root of colare, uh, colire, pardon me, uh, which means to till, to cultivate, to tend or care for, or to honor. So if I take care of the gods, they will take care of me. <laughs> the will of the gods was often sought through divination. And divination was the assumption that if we look carefully, that the gods will send messages or signs to us that will help us understand whether we have their pleasure or displeasure. Uh, those uh, messages came to us in the form of auspices. Uh, auspices usually uh, were it was observation of birds. When we saw the flight pattern of birds. Uh, it was uh, tells us whether the gods were favorable for that particular day. When you read the story of the founding of Rome with Romulus and Remus, they argued about which hill should be the hill for Rome to be established on. So they decided that they would watch the flight pattern of the birds, and it would tell which of the two of them, Romulus or Remus, would be the one to establish them. Lo and behold, Romulus saw 12 birds flying in the sky. Remus saw six birds flying in the sky. So Romulus became the founder of the city of Rome, and by the way, subsequently killed his brother. <laughs> uh, one could look for auspices, and that's how we got the idea of an auspicious occasion, yes? A wedding was an auspicious occasion. That day, that particular day, the gods smile on uh, the wedding. 
We also put divine portends. Portends were usually natural or unnatural or unusual things that we would see. And that could bring us a message of the gods' favor or disfavor, usually disfavor, uh, on some future event that was going to go on, not just today, but a future event. Sometimes we look for prodigies. Prodigies were portends for things that would have impact at a future time, but they had state implications so that a prodigy would be something that was declared by one of the state priests, an augur, for example. Uh, and therefore, if Rome decided to go for, to a war, they would do, seek the auspices about whether today is the day to make the decision. They would look for portents as to whether the gods favored this action, and they would declare the portents to be prodigies if, in fact, uh, it was a state mandate. One could also uh, divine through dreams and through prophecies, which I don't have to follow. All these different kinds of ways. There's a, a wonderful story uh, about uh, a Roman naval commander who was about to lead his armada into battle. So, of course, he needed to check the auspices. And one of the ways they often check the auspices was to see the eating habits of a caged chicken. Not you. <laughs> so he had this caged chicken, and he put food in it. And the idea was, if the, if the chicken ate hungrily, the gods favored, smiled upon that particular day for this act. And, and if the chicken didn't eat very well, well, then the gods didn't favor. So this uh, naval commander has all of his ships ready to go, and he has his uh, priest to bring up the caged chicken. He puts food in there for the chicken, and the chicken doesn't eat. So the story goes that the commander picks up the cage of the chicken, and he throws it in the sea, and he says, if you can't eat, swim. <laughs> the chicken drowned. He lost the bet. So caged chickens are very, very important. <laughs> now, I'm going to have to go back over here for this. What you see here is obviously a relief of uh, the Emperor Marcus Aurelius bringing a, uh, an offering. This building behind him on the relief uh, was that uh, Jupiter, Jupiter Optimus Maximus, Jupiter the best and greatest. That was the temple. You see here the people in togas, but you'll notice here that Marcus Aurelius has his head covered. The person who offered the sacrifices, the offerer, the sacrifice, not the person who killed the animals, but the offerer would cover their heads. That was the Roman way. The Greek way of sacrifice was not to cover your head. Uh, and then you'll notice here in this picture, here is the bull that they're going to offer. Here's a guy who's naked to the waist. You see he's got an axe. He's going to be the one that ultimately dispatches the animal. Over here we have a young child who's carrying an incense box. Here is the altar. And you'll notice that it's not the focus is not on the temple itself. The focus is on the altar in front of the temple. And then there is this this one particular person who was blowing a flute. Uh, you'll find in a while that people were very concerned about making the offerings appropriately. And therefore, uh, you had to say the prayers properly. You couldn't make a mistake. Sometimes they would actually write them out. We're actually going to do a prayer, a, a Roman prayer at the moment. And they also didn't want to be distracted by a loud noise, by somebody screaming, uh, by rap music or whatever. <laughs> so they would very often bring a musician so that the music would block out outside sounds. Uh, in the Capitoline Museum, there is a reconstruction of what they believe the Temple of Jupiter um, 
Optimus Maximus uh, look like. Just an interesting thing, because it will come to play later. You'll notice it has many columns. It looks kind of Greek. You'll notice that there is not a large space on the inside, because these temples weren't made for people to go inside as we would go to church or synagogue and pray inside. They were actually the homes of the gods. There would be a big statue on the inside. In this case, a statue of Jupiter, along with a couple other goddesses that would be there with them. And uh, uh, it would be a place that would be often built by a vow of somebody who sought the god's favor. I'm a general. I'm going out to battle. I do my auspices to find out whether it's the day to go. I uh, take a look at, uh, at uh, my uh, uh, prodigies and so on. And then I say to God, if you give me victory, I make a vow to build you a temple, a memorial, or something like that when I'm through. Well, obviously, he won. So he's paying back his vow. Uh, at this temple. You'll see this shape again in a little while. Now, the, not all of the uh, sacrifices were done by individuals in their home or were done by individuals at uh, on state occasions. Uh, this is, I'm going to go back and get This is uh, a special kind of offering. So that uh, it's actually the pig, sheep, and bull offering. And you can see here, here's the bull, here's the sheep, here's the pig. And if you look carefully, you will see who the offerer is. See the covered head? He's probably a farmer because this uh, pig, sheep, bull, or bull, sheep, pig offering was a way of cleansing the land. So we know that if you want to cleanse the land, you would get these three animals, you'd lead them to the various parts of your land, and then ultimately you would come to the altar right here. And uh, again, you can see the implements for the altar, uh, things like uh, uh, spice box, box with <coughs> spices, uh, a wine cup, very often a gold or silver bowl. And the person who wanted to uh, purify their land would then lead them around the property, around the perimeters, until it came time for the actual sacrifice. The sacrifice wasn't just spilling the blood of the animals, it also had to do with proper prayer. And here you find a proper prayer. Did you read that? No. No, that's honest, very honest. Uh, Sally, would you come forward, please? Uh, would you we have a card or something to put over your head? There you go, very good, very good. Okay, now would you read loudly so everybody and the camera can hear this prayer uh, for the sacrifice? Father Mars. I pray and beseech you to be benevolent and well disposed toward me, my house, and all my house for this intent I will order a big sheep hole procession to be led around my field, land, and farm so that you will keep away, ward off, and avert diseases, both seen and unseen, barrenness, crop losses, disasters, and unreasonable weather to so then you will allow the harvest, the grass crops, the vineyards, and the orchards to flourish and achieve productive maturity so that you will protect the shepherds and the flocks and bestow good health and strength upon me, my house, and my house. Thank you so much. <laughs> upon me, I want to be personally taken care of. Upon my house, that's my natural family, my wife and my children, and my household includes me, my wife, and my children, and also all the slaves and servants that work for me. So you'll notice the prayer isn't very poetic, but it's very pragmatic and straightforward. Uh, the worshiper, the sacrificer, was very clear about what they hoped would happen. Um, we talked about all of that. 
that. We talked about Marcus Williams. Um, one, pardon? Did they only take the Greek gods, or did they also take French gods? Very, very, it's a good question. First of all, these were the gods that basically are in and around Rome. Rome is not a pagan society, it's a polytheistic society which means many gods. And that really was the way the world was, by and large, except for that group of people who were all Jews that are going to be in Jerusalem. And that meant wherever Rome went as the empire expanded, they knew that they were going to come up against people that had different kinds of gods. In fact, that was de rigueur. Roman gods, uh, uh, many of them were very local. So when you went into another property, another district, and so on, you would encounter other gods. Uh, what the Romans required, as we'll see in a little while, uh, is not that you give up your gods. You know, if we beat you, then if Ohio State wins, the gods of Nebraska must be forsaken. Uh, yeah, right job. Uh, uh, actually, what, what would happen is you could continue worshiping your gods even in the midst of Rome, as long as you would include in your worship sacrifices, offerings to the god of the state. Because if you didn't help Rome satisfy the gods of the state, that was in its own way seditious. Because the Roman gods might not be disposed to the will of the Roman, Roman government and Roman people. So it's real possible uh, to include other gods. As a matter of fact, when you look at Roman religion, one of the things that they often did is when they went out and they had a battle and they won, they would invite the defeated god to come back into the Roman pantheon. And that's how a lot of these temples, you know, build your house if you come. So, <laughs> so it wasn't a stupid question. Thank you so much. Oh, well, we just pray. Um, I wanted to uh, share with you something that Cicero said about these kinds of prayers and what they thought of, about these kinds of sacrifices. He underscores the fact that praying and sacrificing is very practical. He said, did anyone ever give thanks to the gods because he was a good man? That's a rhetorical question. The answer being no. Um, or uh, uh, did so because he was rich. Uh, the reason people give thanks was because they, they were rich and honored and secure. Jupiter is called best and greatest not because he makes men just, moderate, and wise, but because he makes them healthy, secure, wealthy, and prosperous. So it's pretty clear that we're not talking about some kind of an ethical thing here. We're talking about, I want you on my side. I want to have comfortable clothes, good food, be healthy. Now, I mentioned before the uh, gods of the house and the genius, the genius gods and so on. Um, if you've been in Rome and you have had a chance to walk on the uh, Via Appia Antica, the old Appian Way, it's an amazing road after well over 2,000 years, it still works unless you have those lousy bicycles that we have right <laughs> But uh, Romans very often, since that was the, one of the main arteries in and out of the city, it was filled with commerce and travelers all the time, many of the Romans would build their tombs at the side of the Appian Way. And in those tombs, or on those tombs, they very often put these statues or reliefs of deceased relatives. So you get a real sense of the monumental nature of the funerary industry in, in ancient Rome. Uh, and we know a little bit about the processions which brought bodies to these places to be interred. One of the things that people would do is they would go to their house to that shelf on which they kept the masks of, of their ancestors, and they would wear those masks representing 
the gods of the individuals throughout their generations in procession to, uh, to the funeral. Uh, it really is quite an interesting thing uh, to see the variety of different, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, the variety of different tombs in such a long way. The next uh, function is that ritual uh, uh, and its correct performance are critically important. Go well, back to that picture that we saw with the flutist, <coughs> the musician. You don't want to make a mistake with the words. If you make a mistake with the words, you have to start over. If you take your animal and it's a perfect animal without blemish, it has to be perfect that way, and we'll come into play when we talk about Jerusalem Temple, and you slaughter that animal, and let's just say it happens to be a bull. A bull is expensive. That's a very expensive sacrifice to wealthy did that. But if in the saying of the prayer, you make a mistake, you stutter, you stumble, somebody distracts you, you have to offer another animal and start the procedure all over again. So doing the rituals properly, very, very important to the Romans. And therefore, we find manuscripts of prayers, especially on the state level, when we're dealing with senators who are also uh, priests, they have the prayers written out, the procedures written out, so that no one will make a mistake. That's kind of important. And you will see that that's also important when it comes to the Jerusalem Temple. The God's concern is more with the material success than with ethical behavior. You know, think about all the prayers you hear offered in church or synagogue. Help me to be a good person. <laughs> I don't want to be selfish anymore. I want to help others. I want to, I want to have correct behavior and God will help me with that. The Roman gods weren't so concerned about that. The Romans were very concerned about virtue, but the gods didn't teach it. The gods wanted the finer things of life, like a bowl of sheep or a pig. <laughs> Religion and politics are interconnected. Everything that, that, I guess it is still, still uh, you intend it that way, but it's um, Everything in Rome, from what you did as a family to what the Senate did in terms of deciding to go to war, deciding to make peace, deciding to give land to the troops or get bread from Egypt, wheat from Egypt to bring it and give to the poor people or whatever. They didn't give it to the poor people because they were poor. They gave it to the poor people because they wanted votes. Um, but um, all of that required religious ceremony. So when one came to the Senate, there were all kinds of, uh, of uh, religious functionaries in the Senate. And they would start every Senate day, every Senate day, every time they would be, uh, as the Senate, checking the auspices to see whether it was a propitious time to do things and so on and so forth. Uh, business transactions, never conclude a contract, without checking the auspices to see whether it was the right day to do it. And if it was the wrong day, if the chicken drowned, then you better do it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, military matters especially uh, uh, very, very important in terms of religious ceremonies. And that's especially where a person would say, if you give me victory, I vow a temple to you. I vow uh, special offerings or sacrifices to you. And so That one of the great religious ceremonies, uh, aside from sacrifice, was the triumph. Uh, the triumph began when a military leader, a general, was victorious in battle. And if he was really victorious and they really wanted to, to uh, honor him, they would give him a triumph. It began with Pampa, as in Pampa and Circumstance, a great parade. And in the parade, the general would be dressed up as Jupiter, very often with his face painted blue. And he would lead the troop in to the city, going down the Via Sacra, 
in a sacred way that will go through the Forum and ultimately up to the Capitoline Hill, as we saw Marcus Aurelius in that relief sometime. And with him would come his soldiers, all the booty that he had uh, captured, all the, the things of value that he had captured, all the slaves that he had captured, the leaders uh, of the foreign people that he had captured and, uh, and defeated. And they would then come in, uh, uh, down the sacred way, through the forum, and up to the Capitoline Hill. Uh, and he would be dressed as the god Jupiter. Uh, it was a big time, a very important time. Um, we talked for a moment in that one relief about the guy who was naked to the waist. He was actually the person that would sacrifice the animal. And it was really bloody, especially if it had a big animal. Uh, what would happen is, uh, uh, for the sacrifice, you would have a slave boy as you saw, they're naked to the waist to control the animal, hold it by the head, and ultimately have the axe or the knife. Uh, he would knock the victim, that would be the animal, on the head so it would fall to its knees. He cuts the throat. <clears throat> he cuts open the carcass of the animal. They check the carcass on the inside to see the auspices. They inspect the animal. We have a while we get the kosher a bit. Uh, <laughs> They, uh, if there was some disqualifying mark uh, in keeping kosher, you'd check to see whether the lungs are healthy. If the lungs weren't healthy and the animal would have died anyway, it's not kosher. If there's a disqualifying mark in this Roman sacrifice, you have to do it over again. Some of the guts that were taken out of the animal were then burned up on the altar, with that smoky stuff, and then the sacrificer would often <coughs> take the rest of the meat and have a big banquet, uh, a feast with the rest. Talked about the Romans and the wars. I think perhaps the most important thing to remember uh, about Roman religion is a that it was they were very devout about it very important to them. B, it had to be done right, not just what was offered, but how it was offered, and the prayers that were said. C, it was a way of soliciting the God's favor, and therefore, if you didn't do it, you were not helping to find God's favor, and that was bad for the family, or the military operation, or the state. So it become very important when we talk about what happens when Roman culture comes in contact with Jewish culture. So now, since I've taken enough time with that, okay, um, let's go to Jewish culture now for a moment. Uh, we know that Jewish culture, uh, as it, uh, we're told in the Bible, also began with a sense of sacrifice. When Abraham was about to make his covenant with God, the first thing that he did, before he <laughs> circumcised himself in his gift, the first thing that he did was to do what was called the covenant between the pieces. What would happen is, this is in Genesis 15, uh, he would offer up a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young bird. In this case, offering them up means that he would split them down the middle, and he would set them in two files, two rows. And then what would happen is the sacrificer, in this case Abraham, would walk between the pieces and meet the God, in this case. Uh, and so we know that sacrifice was early on part of, of, uh, of Jewish life. Um, we also have the story of the, called the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, the story in Genesis where Abraham is commanded by God to offer up his son. You know that story? It's not a nice story. It's a very difficult story for many people. But in this story, what happens? God says to Abraham, just like everybody else, take your son up to the mountain 
and offer them up as a burnt offering. That was not unusual for many of the religions in the ancient Near East to have child sacrifice. In uh, uh, Carol's book, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he speaks about these acts of violence against a child or an animal were ways to help us control our innate violence inside. You know, I do a little bit of violence so that I don't have to do a lot of violence. We still do that. You know, we have an attack on the World Trade Center, and we say we're going to go after these people. They're dangerous. They're going to kill all of us and so on. So what we do, we have a campaign of shock and awe. We send in all of our aircraft and missiles and so on and so forth. And why do we do it? Because we figure if we really hit them hard, then ultimately there'll be less violence in us. Uh, some people say that that's the way these sacrifices work. But with Abraham and his son Isaac, an interesting thing happens. When he's ready to plunge the knife into his kid, an angel calls from heaven and says, stop that, that's not what God wants. And that would have caught people's attention. Because everybody thought, that's what God wants. Don't like it, but that's what God wants. So this story talks about substitutional offering, offering the ram in place of the sun. Uh, we do that very often in our society. And then we're going to move forward uh, into the book of Exodus now, because an interesting thing happens. We need somebody to read Exodus for me. Dan, would you read a little Exodus for me? Don't bother with the Hebrew. <laughs> and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they take from me an offering of every man whose heart maketh him willing, he shall take my offering. And this is the offering which we shall take of gold and silver and brass and blue, purple, scarlet, and fine linen, and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and seal skins, and acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate. <coughs> <laughs> and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the furniture thereof even so shall you make it thank you so we are dealing here yet with another offering but this time it's not an offering of an animal or a vegetable of course, I think the seal skins would be hard to come by in the wilderness, but nonetheless, uh, it's an offering of things that are consecrated for the purpose of a suli mikdash, make for me a holy place that I might dwell in their midst. Uh, this is early on in Genesis, of course, to be during the wilderness, and what they created uh, was this holy place that's often called the tabernacle. It's instructive to take a look at that for a variety of reasons. First of all, you see the orientation. Where is the orientation? Here is the front of the tabernacle of the tent. And it faces east. The back, where the Holy of Holies is, faces west. So when the tent of the tabernacle is set up, its orientation follows the sun. The sun rises in the east, even way back then, and sets in the west. What about Catholic churches? They are also oriented the same way. So that the sun rises in the front and moves through them, as it were, to uh, the rear. You'll notice from here that the first thing that was erected was this curtain wall. Outside the wall was the desert. It was the ordinary, the whole. The word 
means ordinary. It also sounds like sand. It's the ordinary place. So one of the things that we find is that this curtain wall marks off the ordinary space from the holy space. Ordinary space, the holy space. And that's one of the definitions of what is sacred, what is holy. It's bounded. It has lots of rules about it. Uh, when you go into uh, the chapel here on campus and you see the candle burning and in the tabernacle, uh, the host rests. If there's host left over, they lock it away. It's got all kinds of boundaries so that you know it's holy. Even the candle tells you it's holy. I mean, if you walk in and see the candle, you know if you're a Catholic that you're in the presence of a consecrated host. In your home, you have places that are holier than other places. How do we know? They have locks on the doors. You tell the children, you can come into my room without knocking. Or as in the home that I grew up in, you put plastic over all the furniture. Only <laughs> <laughs> guests can come. So one of the things we see by this description is that this was a holy place because it was bounded. In the front of this, uh, in the front of uh, this, uh, you will find uh, a sacrificial altar, right here, a brazen altar, big altar. Here you have a laver. It is a large, uh, a large basin of water, so that uh, the people who offer the sacrifices will be able to uh, purify themselves before they offer the sacrifice. And then you move into the tent, and on the outside of the tent you have what's called the holy place. Some interesting things here. The table of the showbread was a baker's rack on which there were... It's a kind of baker's rack that holds a loaf of bread, unleavened bread, representing each of the tribes, probably representing the manna, God's providential care of each of the tribes. You'll find an incense altar right there. They would burn sweet-smelling incense. Why do you think we do that? Burn incense. Keep the smell down. Because what you're looking at is a sacred slaughterhouse. And I'm from Omaha. We used to have the largest slaughterhouses in the stockyards in the country, and believe me, it smells. So you burn incense. Why do they burn incense for funerals? In addition to that, there was the real symbol of the Jewish people, the seven-branch candelabra. The word menorah actually means candelabra, and this one had seven branches, three, three, and one. Those of you who go into Catholic churches and see candles on the altar, how many do you see? Very often, three, three, and one. Probably hearkening back to this biblical description of having a candle, a candelabra. And then finally, when you went through the uh, holy place, you would come to the holy of holies. And in the holy of holies, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments in that big acacia wood box that was overlaid with gold and had poles for people to carry it. That was the Holy of Holies. And there were two cherubim, some people say they were Phoenician angels or whatever. Uh, and the cherubim uh, were overarching this uh, ark so that it almost became like a seat, a chair. And in <coughs> fact, they believed that God rested on that chair. Uh, sat upon the ark and was available to special people. Moses had another tent called the Tent of Meeting. It's where he could you know, have a cappuccino with God and they would discuss the next day's march, uh, things like that. <clears throat> but this place uh, was a very, very sacred place. Now, who ran this, uh, this uh, uh, Tent of Meeting? All the tribes of Israel had a particular place to camp around where the ark, where the uh, the mikdash, the tabernacle, would be. But one tribe of Israel, the tribe of Levi, 
we know them as Levites. Um, the tribe of Levi was not given an inheritance when they would go into the Promised Land. They would be involved with taking care of the sacred things, like the tabernacle. So the basic Levite would be the person who was we would call the ministers today. Uh, part of their job was to take the tabernacle down and store it away when we were moving from one place to the other in the wilderness. Then they would be the schleppers, they'd carry it. And then they would set it up again when it came to another place. From the Levites, this group of families that comprised the tribe of Levi, there was one family, the family of Kahan, who became the Kohanim, the priests. It so happens that both Moses and Aaron were from the tribe of Levi and the family of Kohanim. And we know that Moses' brother Aaron was named the first of the priests. He was the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, and his children were lesser priests. And that was a hereditary position. The Kohen was like a Catholic priest, shall we say. The Catholic priest was like a Kohen, because the Kohen was the one who could actually offer the sacrifices. And he would offer the sacrifices and go through a lot of that stuff that that we read about in the Roman sacrifice. So the tribe of Levi was responsible for this portable sanctuary that went with the Jewish people through, uh, through the wilderness, for the story, and when they would put it up, it would face east, its opening would face the east, the Holy of Holies would be on the west, and all the tribes had particular places to camp around it. It was the organizing principle of the people. Its purpose then was to offer sacrifice. Hmm. So, we get out of the wilderness, we get through the book of Judges, and we enter the promised land, and ultimately the people want a king. Prophet Samuel says, you don't want a king. God is your king, you don't need another king. People say, we want a king. Samuel goes to God and says, what can I tell you? They want a king. And God says, no, don't worry about it. You'll find a king. And he goes and finds Saul. Saul's distinguishing feature is that he was tall. He could never be a king of Israel. <laughs> never. Saul was, according to the Bible, head and shoulders taller than the other people. Good looking man. So uh, Samuel takes Saul out and he anoints him. The word for uh, someone who is anointed in Hebrew is Mashiach. What does that word mean in English? What do we translate that as? Messiah. The Messiah is someone who is anointed, basically for royalty. Uh, unfortunately, Saul went a little crazy. And so God's favor went away from Saul and was given over to David. And then David became Mashiach. He was anointed. And in addition to being anointed, God said to David, your hereditary line will forever be the kings of Israel. So the people who can be Mashiach have to be related to King David. For those of you who read the New Testament, doesn't that sound familiar? Because you go through the genealogies that will say that Jesus is related to King David. Because if he's not related to King David, everybody knew it couldn't be Mashiach. So he's related to King David through those genealogies. Now David, around the year 1000, I don't have a calendar, I don't know what day it was. Around the year 1000, David, who was king of all the people now, uh, took his soldiers, his, uh, his men, and they captured Jebus from the Jebusites. It's an interesting thing. Jebus, which became Jerusalem, was actually not in any tribal area. It was sort of in between. Recognize the Washington, D.C. idea? It's not in any colony. It's sort of in between. So David conquers uh, Jebus and 
moves inside the walls and builds himself a palace, and now they call it uh, Ir David, the city of David. And he wants to thank God. I mean, what does a what does a soldier, a general who defeats the enemy want to do? He wants to build a, a temple to God. But God tells David, because his hands are filled with blood, he was a warrior, uh, he's not able to do that, but his son will. And when David dies, one of his sons, Solomon, becomes the one who actually builds uh, the Beit HaMikdash, uh, the holy house, if you will. Around 950, we don't have a lot of description about it, but we do have some information uh, about this temple. Now take a look at this temple, and I want you to think about the temple of Jupiter um, Optimus Maximus. This temple is kind of small. You can't get a whole bunch of people on the inside. What's on the inside? It's not a statue. But it's that ark thing, you know? That box with the Ten Commandments in it. The rabbis tell us it's the broken tablets of the First Commandments, the full tablets of the Second Commandment, and also the master Torah scroll that uh, Moses wrote. And every king would have to read and copy to, to study it. So it tells us already that for the people, whatever action the people took was outside that building, because there's not enough room for everybody to get inside. Time goes on, and um, in the year 586, that temple that Solomon built about 950 is destroyed by the Babylonians. They burn the wood, it blows up the limestone, and the temple is in ruins, ruins, and the uh, the uh, Opportunity to offer sacrifice in Jerusalem no longer exists. Uh, the Babylonians carry off a significant number of the Jews to Babylon. Babylon, they become slaves. And they have a terrible problem. Because in the Torah, the Hebrew Bible, it says at least three times a year people are supposed to appear at Jerusalem to make their offerings at the temple. And there were daily offerings that were supposed to be offered by the Kohanim, the priests, at the temple. And without the temple, without that location, they couldn't offer sacrifices just anywhere. So if you're in Babylonia, how do you deal with that? We believe that in Babylonia, we had an institution that we call today the synagogue. People would get together in a Beit Knesset, the house of gathering, and that's where they would conduct the business of the people in exile. What do we have to do to talk to the king of Babylon? How do we divvy up these costs? We're going to collect some money and send it back home to our people back home. And these were the holidays we used to celebrate back there. We'll celebrate them in exile. We had a problem that when you're not in Jerusalem, where the temple stood, it's too easy to forget your heritage. So we believe in Babylonia. The formalization was the Beit Sefer, the house of the book, the school. And it was there that adults and children were taught, this is what God did for us in the wilderness. And this is what this holiday means. And this is how we do uh, this particular ritual action. And finally, the biggest problem, how can we worship God? There's a little tiny verse in Hosea. It's Hosea 14. In which the prophet says, uh, bring to me, meaning God, the bullocks of your lips. You know, a bull was a sacrifice. But what are the bullocks of your lips? Words. So our words and prayer by the people in Babylonia became tantamount to actually doing the sacrifices. After 70 years or so, Jews came back to the Jerusalem where the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians. The Persians had a different foreign policy. They let the Jews go home, let them take back the sacred vessels and things. And after a while, this community of the return rebuilt what came to be known as the Second Temple on the very foundations of the first. And they reestablished the sacrificial cult with two interesting differences. Number one, 
number one, uh, they uh, uh, came back and also seemed to have prayer services that went on in the temple while you had the sacrifices that went on. So they had both forms of worship. And number two, the Holy of Holies was now empty. We don't know what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. Perhaps Indiana Jones does. <laughs> so we now have a second temple built on the foundations of the first. We speed forward to the last part of the first century before the Common Era, and we have a guy by the name of Herod, Herod the Great. He rules from 37 before the Common Era until 4 before the Common Era. And during that time, because now half a century has passed since the first temple was built, we can build bigger, taller, better, faster, more beautifully. Herod, who builds for everybody else, wants to build a new temple on the foundations of the old. But there are two problems. Number one, that temple area on the top of Mount Zion was so sacred that only priests could go certain places. Only Kohanim could go certain places. He didn't say, I'm going to go out to lunch, let the workers come in and I'll fix it. And the second thing, which was even more difficult, was that there were many people amongst the Jewish people that were fearful that when Herod, in order to build this new structure, would have to level the old one, is that he would destroy the old temple and never build a new one. But he was the king. He was able to do it. How did he solve the first problem? He got himself 10,000 workers to do all the labor and manual stuff. And then he took a thousand Kohanim, a thousand priests, and he trained them to stone masons and brothers. So that thousand priests had honest labor from morning to day. They were the ones who would do the sacred building in the sacred area. Uh, this building stood until after Herod died, significantly after Herod died. Uh, it wasn't finished until about 63 of the common era. That means not only was the temple finished, but all its surrounding courtyards and so on. It was open from 63 until the year 70 when the Romans destroyed it. So it really was only open for full business for seven years. Let's take a look at it. There's some things that you should see immediately that look a little bit like that tent of meeting in the wilderness. First of all, you see a building who a building whose was the person whose front face what direction? East. The Holy of Holies was on the west side of the temple. Where would be what was called the Wailing Wall, and is now called the Western Wall? You see, Herod could build much better, had much greater technology uh, and engineers than they had 500 years before. So the first thing that Herod did was he built this large retaining wall around the top of the mountain. Mountains go like this. He built the wall like this, filled it all in, so he had a much larger table on which to build this temple. Huge space, big space. It accommodates tens of thousands of people. Uh, you can see that many people there now on some of the Muslim uh, festivals because they just fill from wall to wall the top of uh, the mosque. So he built this big wall, and then in the middle, on the foundation of the ancient temple, he built this structure. He built this structure right here. And this part of it was actually on the foundation of the old one. stood initially about six stories tall. Then you see the other parts of it. Uh, if you look carefully, as I'm going to do more term, <coughs> try to point out some of these things for this special. We have here the Holy of Holies. 
that's where the ark would have been. But it's empty now. We have here uh, curtains, the parotte, that separate the holy space from the holy space from the holy of holies. It's in this space that you'll find the incense altar, uh, the menorah, the candle stand, and so on and so on. Uh, number four is the, uh, that's the incense altar. And then you have this area here, which is kind of a porch, and steps here that go down into a large porch. And steps that go down even further. And as you go in here, only the high priest could go in here on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. Only priests could go in here. Levites and priests here. Uh, men with the chamber for the women, a place for the women could go in here. And uh, only Jewish people go in here. Uh, we've got another picture here. Beautiful reconstruction, you can see. Uh, first of all, what direction am I standing? I'm on the east, looking west. So this is the front of the temple right here. The sun rises through that door, as you look. If you've been to Jerusalem and seen the rebuilt model, these are two towers. One's called Mariamna, and the other's called Phasma. Those were Herod's wife and his son. He actually had them both executed, and then out of deference to them, built these towers uh, in very nice way. Uh, the western wall, the what's called the Wailing Wall, now is just called the Wall, is behind here, and then across here. And this is the upper city, the city where the wealthy folks live. A lot of the priests have gone in there, you see. Here are the steps and the various gates. So you can begin to see, by the restrictions of who can go where, that this was a holy site. Now this is a monumental site. It's huge. And it's huge because the people's ritual sacrifices go on there all the time. And on the three times a year, it says in the Bible, three times a year you shall appear before the Lord come to Jerusalem, and they are the festival of Pesach, of Passover, the beginning of spring, Shavuot, Feast of Weeks, the beginning of the summer, and finally Sukkot, which we just now finished, the uh, harvest festival in the fall. Well, that commandment wasn't just for people who happened to live in Jerusalem. It was for Jews everywhere, all around the world. So three times a year, this city of Jerusalem would swell to overflowing with pilgrims. Tens of thousands, one estimate suggested that the Mishnah says, the rabbinic literature says, uh, in the tractate Yoma, which is about the sacrifice for Yom Kippur, 1.2 million people came into Jerusalem. That was like all of Rome at one time. Huge. Uh, so you could see the industry that this sacrificial cult ran, with all the sacrifices that came, and all the problems that you had with them. Look, I come from the Roman Empire, and I bring money with me. I don't want to schlep an animal and I break its leg on the way, so I'm going to bring money with me. But I have a problem. The coins that I brought from my part of the Roman Empire have what on them? <coughs> a picture of the Caesar. That's a graven image. I can't bring that into Jerusalem, which doesn't believe in graven images. So I would have to find a way to change my money from the money of Gaul into the temple shekel, into a, a, a coin that A, didn't violate uh, religious sensibilities, and B, was of equal value. So they had money changers there. Think about that. You, know, you can't go to the airport in Rome without going to money changers first. Uh, they had money changers at the temple. Uh, and the money changes were there because people need to be able to offer an appropriate sacrifice. So they would change their money into the temple shekel, and then they would go and they would buy appropriate animals, or vegetables, or whatever, from people to make a sacrifice. So now you've got this tremendous industry, allied, the Circleite Hall of Fame. You know, the big deal is the parade and the game, but then you've got all these people that come in and have to buy the right garb and the proper hat, 
We've got people who come in from out of town who need to find a place to stay. In this case, it would be, catch this, a holiday inn. <laughs> it was big time in Jerusalem at the temple. Uh, that temple, for those of you who are Christian, the things that I'm going to read about that temple now are things that Jesus would have seen and would have said and would have done. Because remember, this was destroyed in the year 70. It was in full operation when Jesus lived around uh, the first third of the first century. This is the way that area looks today. This wall, which is called the Western Wall, means that it's not part of the temple itself, it's part of that retaining wall that Herod built that goes all the way down here to the southern wall, and all the way back on the eastern side, and all the way back over here on the northern wall. This was the retaining wall. Uh, it's about 100 feet. If we were to uncover the entire thing, it would be about 100 feet. This, called the Dome of the Rock, it's not technically a mosque. The Dome of the Rock is a beautiful thing that was built in, I think, the 8th century or 7th century. is built right on top of the rock, which was considered to be the sacrificial altar, or probably where the Holy of Holies was. Now, I'll take go back here. If this is where the Western Wall is, and this is where the Holy of Holies is, when you are at the Western Wall, you are as close to the Holy of Holies as you can get, without actually going on top of it. Because over this area is where that dome is today. Right down here is the rock. Part of the uh, original temple. Uh, I'm going to read some stuff about that temple. We just want you to take a look at this sort of prelude to Rabbi Abbey's presentation in, uh, in uh, two weeks. When the archaeologists began to excavate along the western wall, the sea was there, they found all of these little stalls, which were actually uh, little shops that were along this major walkway, pedestrian walkway. And then when they got to this place, they found all of these stones. And they know exactly the date when those stones fell. They fell on the ninth of Av, the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av, in the year 70 of the Common Era, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, the Temple of Gideon for so far the last time. And then, so when you're standing on that, you're standing at the ninth of all in your seven. It's kind of amazing. It's sort of like walking the Via Della Rosa or going into, um, there's one gate, one house entrance place in Jerusalem that most Christian archaeologists believe Jesus actually stepped on actually stepped on, on over that lentil. It's the feeling that you get when that happens. You go back in time to the original. So let me tell you a little bit about what actually went on there. Uh, you can actually see a little bit of what went on there by going online and Google either priestly benediction at the wall or Birkat, B-I-R-K-A-T, Kohanim, C-O-H-A-N-I-M. And what you will see there is a ceremony that took place in Jerusalem last week. It was the end of Sukkot. It was the time in which the Kohanim uh, would get together and would bless the people. And they would take their talitot, their prayer shawls, and they would lift them over their heads, catch the sound, so the people wouldn't see their faces or their eyes. 
And somebody would yell out, Yivarechecha. May he bless, may God bless. And all the Kohanim would go down, Yivarechecha. And they would do antiphonally the priestly benediction. And you will see thousands of people in that courtyard, not here, previous one, in that courtyard doing the priestly benediction. Probably very much like it was done in back during Tepic. Uh, one of the most important rituals, I'm almost done, uh, was the ritual of the blessing of the priests, the Abu Dhas service on Yom Kippur. You see, that Holy of Holies in the temple, it was entered only once a year, and only by one person, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. And what would he do in that place? He would pronounce the ineffable name. Why is it called the ineffable name? We don't know how to pronounce it, we don't know what it means. The four-letter name of God, the yud hey vav -Hey. Some people see it as Y-H-W-H. It's the word in which, when we see it in Hebrew, we don't try to pronounce it, we say Adonai, which literally means my Lord. We substitute a word for, uh, for the pronouncing the name. So once a year, the high priest would prepare for the Day of Atonement, the day in which he would, on a national scale, help the Jewish people expiate their sins. The high priest would spend a week in preparation to make sure that he knew the words to say, how to say it, what the ritual was, what the order was, because you couldn't make a mistake. If you made a mistake, the people would have problems. The night before, Yom Kippur, when he would do these rituals, the high priest, they would keep him up all night. Because sometimes during the night, we don't have anybody under 18 here, sometimes during the night, a man can have a nocturnal emission. And a nocturnal emission would disqualify the high priest from doing his sacred things. He'd have to go to the ritual bath and all go through all that. So they would keep him up all night to make sure not only did he know what he was going to do, but he would be in a state of ritual purity. And here are some of the things that he would do. One of the things, I'm going to read a little selection from the Mishnah Yoma. Uh, Mishnah is uh, earliest rabbinic <coughs> literature that was uh, written down around the beginning of the third century of the Common Era. So this was written down uh, by people who they didn't see these sacrifices and things themselves, but they had good historic hearsay and witness, if you will. So um, it says, prior to this point, the high priest has prepared himself by washing several times and clothing himself in linen before beginning the sacrifices of Yom Kippur. Now starts the mission. He came over to his bullock. Now his bullock was set between the porch and the altar, two places in the temple. Its head was uh, to the south and its face to the west. How can that be? <laughs> it spelled down to the directions where people stood. And he puts his two hands on it, you know, on the bullock, and he states the confession. And thus did he say, O oh Lord, I have committed iniquity, transgressed, and sinned before you, I and my house. O oh Lord, forgive the uh, iniquities, transgressions, and sins which I have done by committing iniquity, transgression, and sin before you, I and my house. As it is written in the Torah of Moses, your servant, for on this day shall atonement be made for you to clean you from all your sins shall you be cleansed before the Lord. So the high priest, before he does anything, seeks atonement for himself so he can be pure before he offers the sacrifice. And those who are listening respond to him saying, blessed is the name of the glory of his kingdom forever and ever. He came to the east side of the courtyard, to the north of the, uh, of the altar, with the uh, prefect, that's the person standing beside him, uh, at his left standing beside him, and his left. There were two goats, 
there was also a box with two lots. He shook the box and he brought up the two lots. On one was written for the Lord, and on one was written for Azazel. Azazel was the scapegoat. Time comes for these sacrifices. We have two goats, perfect, unblemished. One is going to be that which takes vicarious atonement for the people, carries the sins away. That's the Azazel. They would put a, a red uh, cord, a ribbon, on its horns, and they would drive it out into the wilderness and go over a cliff, symbolically having the sins of the people taken away. The other goat was then offered up as a sacrifice. We know about sacrifices from looking at the Romans. It had to be done in a particular way. A person who sacrificed had to use a particularly sharp knife. Kill the animal with one swipe of the knife across the, the windpipe of jugular. Trying to do it with as little uh, uh, pain as possible. We know that that animal had to be perfect and without blemish. Because if it had a blemish, it wouldn't be acceptable to God. We know that it was open, and in this particular case, it was burned completely up into ash. It wasn't a lot. They burned off it. Regular sacrifices, he would then open it up, take the guts out, burn up some of the fatty parts, so the smoke would go up to God, a sweet savor, a sweet smell. Everybody loves barbecue. And, and it would be that which was given to God. The priests could take a little bit of the offering for themselves, because that's how they made a living. And the rest would be given back to the worshiper, who would then take it back, and what would he do with it? He'd invite all of his family and all of his neighbors to come together so he could tell the story of God's grace to him. That's sort of what happens at Passover Seder now. We are reenacting this kind of sacrificial thing to bring everybody together so we can tell the story of redemption. So you can read in the in the Mishnah what actually the uh, the uh, priests would do about the offering, about uh, getting ready to go into the Holy of Holies. He would wash his hands ten times during the day. He would change his garments five times during the day. And at the most important time, they would tie a cord around him so that he would be, in a sense, connected to the outside world, and he would enter into the Holy of Holies, that powerful holy place, and he would pronounce God's name. And just in case something happened to him, he fainted, he had a heart attack, whatever it might be, that cord would allow the people to pull him out because they couldn't do it again. That's how sacred it was. Uh, Jewish religion at this particular time had a highly developed sacrificial cult. It had a very political nature as well, with the priests being one group, the climbing being one group, and a certain political outlook on life, or religious outlook on life. It also occurred at the same time that there was a prayer service in that area. Uh, another group of people had their own political outlook, called the Pharisees for a moment. Uh, uh, they had a different outlook during the time of the First Temple about what it was like to live under Roman domination. Uh, but people would come from all around to see these wonderful, wonderful things. Uh, I was going to ask you to, for a short time, Hoshana means save now. Hoshana. One of the things that would happen, and we still uh, you find it in traditional prayer books, the Hoshana still happens today, is the Kohen or the priest would say, Hoshana, Anacha, Elohim. Save now on account of your our God. And the whole people would answer, Hoshana. Can you say Hoshana? Hoshana. Do it one more time. Hoshana. Hoshana, Elohim, Anacha, Elohim. Hoshana. Hoshana, we can reenact those things and be back at that place. <laughs>
come get them, or I'll give them to you. And I thank you very much. I encourage you to come back in uh, two weeks when we might have a little bit of food.